Hey, welcome back, Earth Scientists. Join me today as we dig a little deeper and look at some of the physical properties and structures of igneous rocks. All right, so let's begin with a quick like review of the rock cycle. So again, we're really only focused this video on the igneous process. You know, it doesn't really matter where you go, but what's interesting about how we look at the rock cycle is that there's no stopping point. It's constantly going. So we're going to be talking a lot about some of these terms, such as intrusive, extrusive, uh, crystallization, as we can see here. So the way that this, this diagram is kind of represented, if you wanted to kind of split it in half like this, the splitting in half is going to be under the surface, at the surface and above it really is what it's going to be viewed as. So things that happen underneath are going to be inside the earth or intrusive and things that happen on or above the surface we consider outside or exited the earth so it's going to be extrusive. And what's really neat about this process is that because of where that material that's deep beneath the surface of you know, the earth where it goes out it changes the rate of cooling and then depending on what mineralogy is available will change the lithology or really the chemistry of these rocks. So let's talk about some of these properties of igneous rocks. So you'll notice that we kind of have three bullet points I'm going to work through. The first thing is saying is that igneous rocks form when the melted rock material from inside the earth cools. So that, that can, depending on where that material is being exposed, you know, if it's on the surface, it can cool immediately. Um, you know, maybe you've seen volcanoes erupt and that material hitting in the water and it immediately is cooling because it's, you know, getting, it's interacting with that water. On the other hand, maybe it has a really long cooling time. Uh, it's not uncommon for some rocks to take between 10,000 and 100,000 years to cool down from its molten state. And then even then, it can be reheated. Uh, and that can even lengthen that cooling period as well. So it says the cooling and hardening of melted rock material can occur both on and underneath the Earth's surface. Which brings us into, okay, is it lava or is it magma? Two very different terms. Sometimes people use them interchangeably. It's not correct. Let's just settle it right here. Rock, paper, scissors, right? So lava is what we see on the surface. That's what, when you see it, it's lava. If it's unseen, but it's underneath the surface, we call that magma. Molten magma, and then it's surficial lava. So that's the difference. All right, so let's check out some other properties. So we have intrusive, known as plutonic, and then we have extrusive, also known as volcanic. So intrusive rocks where the crystals are visible to the naked eye. We have some terms that describe that grain size, such as phaneritic, which is like a granite, as we can see in the photo here on the top. Um, or porphyritic, where the, the crystals themselves can even be bigger, like even like larger than a chocolate chip. So you probably have seen these type of rocks, like granite as an example, uh, as a countertop. And when you're looking at that countertop with your, your magnifying lens, and you're like, oh, look at these little crystals. If you can see them with your naked eye, the different, you know, the shades, the pink and the white, you could probably learn, if watching one of my other videos, how to identify some of those basic minerals, because you can see it. Um, and there's different names we use. There's like aphanitic, porphyritic, uh, phaneritic. These are all terms that we, you can look up, but we'll be covering very briefly that describe that grain size. Now, extrusive, on the other hand, may not have grains at all. Um, it may even have things such as um, vesicles or you know, um, which is essentially like trapped air bubbles or channels of where gases and air was trapped. So such as this basalt that you see at the bottom of the page, basalt, you can sometimes call it lava rock, which we now um, know is probably not the best term because it's, it's technically a basalt. Um, these crystals are very, very small um, and may not even have crystals at all, but may, you know, may have other types of physical properties such as vesicles, as we can see here, uh, vesicular basalt. Now, moving forward, we can look at the, even the color of certain igneous rocks. So we have what we consider mafic, intermediate, 
We also have Fes uh, Felsic, rather, um, and we also can have something called Ultramafic, which I'll mention later. But the way that I kind of think about the color of rocks, I think is very well summed up in the photo that you have right down here <laughs> of cats. You know, that we have Mafic, you have Felsic, which are really extremes, you know, in polarity. You have something that's black and versus white. And then you have intermediate, which is right in the middle. It's a mix. So mafic, which is traditionally basaltic rock, is much darker in color. Felsic is more granitic, which means it's lighter in color. And then lastly, we have intermediate, which is a really nice mix of those two um, colorings. So what does that really look like and how do we see it further into rock? So here are some examples of rocks. You've got rhyolite, andesite, and basalt. These are all igneous rocks. Um, so as you can see that rhyolite is more felsic, andesitic is more in between, and basalt is more mafic, it's darker. What's neat about this image here though, is that um, within this basaltic rock, you can see that there's air vesicles or pockets where air was. Um, and a word that I have never been able to pronounce well. Uh, it's uh, amygdals, which is essentially like, um, it's like a mini geode that has crystallized. So another mineral has been filled within that vesicle, um, usually maybe, maybe it's a quartz, and it kind of crystallizes within that vacancy, which is pretty cool. But here we have a great example of those extremes. So you have your felsic, which is much lighter in color, your basaltic, which is much darker in color, and then you have something smack dab in the middle, which is like if you took those two flavors, vanilla and chocolate, and mixed together, you have something more within that middle piece, or that intermediate. Which brings us then to some additional properties, which is pretty cool. Um, so these happen to all be um, extrusive, meaning that they formed outside the Earth's surface. And I say that, you know, so you're familiar with it, but I want to talk about the properties that we can observe. So as an example, using your magnifying lens, you can look down at that obsidian, which I have a piece here in my hand. This is actually um, a piece that we collected on a field trip a long time ago. But what you can see that this obsidian has, such as in the video in this right here, this is um, called conchoidal fracturing. So when I think of the word conchoidal, I think of like a clamshell. And you have probably seen that if you've ever broken a piece of glass and you can see how that glass gets really thin and it has that unique fracture to it. And that really is the result of its mineral um, identity uh, being that it's rich in, uh, in glass, it's silica. Here we have uh, scoria, which you know, they're using uh, a European spelling of color, uh, but it's darker red because it's been oxidized due to weathering, uh, but it has those vesicles. And then here's a piece of pumice, which is unique uh, because it's also vesicular. It floats on water, it's really lightweight. It's volcanic glass, which means it formed very rapidly, just like obsidian. But the difference in this case is that this pumice had trapped gases within it. Um, it could have been done because of the, the gases that were there, or maybe even including things such as um, uh, sometimes like water, and when water is heated up immediately, it, it you know, turns into a vapor. Uh, but you get these air bubbles that are trapped within there. So moving forward with this, this idea is that we can even look at uh, what I said earlier, like the lithology or the chemistry when you're cooking up these rocks. When looking at what dominant minerals are present within that sample, we can identify also whether it be felsic, intermediate, mafic, or ultramafic. And I like this diagram for a couple reasons. One is that it kind of gives that perspective that, okay, so this is like, if you want to talk about recipes, these are the minerals that when they're, you know, when the rock itself is cooling and it has these minerals, if it's whether intrusive, this is what you'll probably get. And if it's extrusive, that's what you would probably get. So that's the first thing I like. The second part is how is it really devised? Is it is based on percentages. So they give us a nice little scale here. So you could say that, well, I have a sample that has, you know, 10% feldspar, or it has a, maybe it has 80% um, albite or quartz or olivine or pyroxene. Uh, any of these additional minerals that may be present, we can look at it and break it up based on percentages. So we can see that on the left-hand side, looking at felsic, uh, at, I just go straight to our um, you know, potassium or our uh, feldspars, and you can see our quartz. 
quartz and feldspar quartz again is you know between quartz and feldspar that's 98 percent of our earth's crust is made out of those minerals but quartz is what we, we can melt down to create glass feldspar we can then turn into a ceramic or porcelain so it's very very common something that we have that's very glassy it, if you drop it it shatters and then uh, you move forward by introducing other blends um, play, you know, as you have your plagioclase feldspar, your pyroxene and olivine, and those things will start to additionally add into its uh, development into being mathic or ultramathic. Uh, and then we can also take into consideration uh, you know, your irons or your more heavier metals that could be, um, that will be more visible as you move towards ultramathic. So another thing that's interesting when we look at igneous rocks is uh, looking at what we call the Bowen's reaction series, and we use it in, in ident the identity of igneous rocks, but we also use it when looking at um, weathering and erosion, because certain minerals uh, are more mm, resilient to weathering, so they hang on longer, uh, and then there's others that may be quicker to dissolve, and there's definitely a correlation with that in the rate of its cooling. So I want to just give this to you very quickly. So this is the Bowen reaction series, which is covered tremendously in most textbooks, but I just want to kind of introduce the concept, show you the image, and then kind of wrap up with that. So the Bowen's reaction series is a conceptual framework developed by Norman L. Bowen that depicts the order in which minerals crystallize from cooling material. This series is based on the idea that as magma cools, the chemical composition of the remaining liquid changes due to the removal of crystals. So you have this blend of molten material, and as some things start to solidify and they start bonding, you take those ingredients out, which then leaves other ingredients that can then intensify. Crystals that form early have a higher melting point and are less rich in silica, or being mafic, compared to the others that form later, which have a much lower melting point and are much richer in silica, known as uh, felsic. So Bowen's reaction series is divided into two branches. There's the discontinuous and the continuous. The discontinuous branch represents minerals that crystallize at distinct temperature intervals. Olivine is the first mineral to crystallize at high, high temperatures, followed by then pyroxene, amphiboly, and then biotite. The continuous branch represents minerals that form throughout a broader temperature range. This branch includes things such as plagial place feldspar, which progressively change in composition as the cooling continues. All right, so here it is, the Bowen's reaction series. So the way that this was done is that Bowen took all of these minerals, ground them up, and then did a high, really, really, really high heat uh, um, environment to try to simulate uh, molten material. And so what we find is we have about 1300 degrees Celsius at the top of our chart down to 750. So what he did is when he was studying these different minerals within these environments, is he found that at the top, your olivine, pyroxene, amphiboly, biotite, as you work your way down the discontinuous branch, that the ones on the top were the first to crystallize. They were the first to cool down. And then as you slowly work down, you know, or over time, once you've got this really, really hot material, and then you allow it to cool down at its own rate, the last to crystallize would be, you know, look, going in order, first is olivine, then pyroxene, then amphiboly, then biotite, and then potassium, feldspar, muscovite, and quartz. That's on the discontinuous branch. On the other side, on the continuous branch, we can see that you've got calcium-rich minerals that are the first to going to be crystallizing, and then it's going to take longer for those sodium rich than your, your potash or your potassium muscovite quartz. So this chart shows us that this rate of cooling, when you have really, really hot you know, material, that certain minerals will cool first. Um, then as you give it more time, they, and you have minerals at the bottom that will um, solidify last. Why is that important? Things on the bottom, so let's say all of these, this material is exposed on the surface, things on the bottom are more resilient to weathering. Things that are more on top, such as your olivines and your, your calcium-rich minerals, will be the first to weather and will be the first to become clays, but that's a whole other conversation. So it's just a very interesting process because it's like, okay, so these different minerals have different rates of cooling in which they bond. And 
as we know, depending on that rate of cooling, just in general, you know, the larger your crystals. So it's just a great way to see it. Other things that I like about this diagram is again, like I said, you've got your temperatures on the far right hand side, your discontinuous, continuous, and then you have your rock type that is often found within those environments, such as your ultramafic, mafic, intermediate, and felsic. And as we can see, it gave us some examples of those different types of rocks. All right, so let's look at this whole thing very quickly within a flow chart. So this flow chart is gonna take you into do two different ways. You begin at the top at igneous. Igneous forms from the cooling and solidification of either lava or magma. And then you have two different ways you're gonna go, either intrusive or extrusive. So intrusive rocks, we'll talk about these right now. Magma cools slowly, perfect. This is a great opportunity to talk about crystalline grain size. So what ends up happening in this case is as you have a longer cooling period within that molten state, those minerals are able to bond and become larger in that cooling. So think of it like people. If you're in a huge classroom of students and I say, okay, you have 60 seconds to create those bonds to create larger crystals. That's not a lot of time, but if I said you had an hour or 10,000 hours or whatever it might be, you're gonna have plenty of time to create those much larger bonds. When we find igneous rocks that have really large crystals, that's like a telltale sign that there was a lot of time available for that rock to develop for the cooling period. So fun fact, one of the hardest rocks because of the grain size, it's such huge crystals, is the, called the Yosemite granite. Yosemite granite is one of the hardest rocks on earth because of how large those crystals have, are in that cooling state. What's unique about that is that uh, it's plutonic, it's this, you had this really long development of, of granitic rock that was cooling. So imagine you baked it really hot in the oven and you were letting it cool down, but instead of letting it get cold, you keep re reheating it. And every time it reheated, it had a little bit longer to, to cool and then to develop. So because of that, you get large crystals. Now we move on to this other side, extrusive. That stuff cools quickly. That lava is gonna cool very quickly. Um, you're gonna get um, things such as uh, maybe basalt, maybe an obsidian, maybe you're gonna get something like a, a, a pumice material. So you're gonna have things that either have very, very small crystals or no crystals at all um, because it cooled so quickly. There wasn't time. Um, if you would like to know more about that, I have a video that I can share with you uh, about volcanoes. And we actually talk more about the cooling rate and the different types of material that is found due to these very rapid, maybe eruptions or, um, or uh, volcanic developments. Um, and then at the bottom part here of our flow chart, it says it may be vesicular, meaning that it may also have air bubbles within it. Okay, so then, crash course, introduction to igneous rocks. So where can we try this? So I have, I have several playlists on my YouTube channel. I recommend it. They're online rock labs. So what's great about these is that when you check out the video, you can, uh, at the bottom, it gives you some information, some, some, uh, some physical properties. So um, as an example, actually, this is a terrible example because this one here is, well, it was igneous. Uh, it has been metamorphosed. It has been manipulated and changed into a, two, into a new type of rock. Uh, but it was igneous. I just happened to take a screenshot of the playlist. Uh, but there are some here, I think sample 1.2. Oh, yeah, it is. It's this guy right here. Um, again, this is, I know it's hard to see, but this is, you know, essentially a black glass. Oh, you can, I wonder if you can see it on my, with my magnifying lens. Oh, maybe not. Um, you can see there's conchoidal fracturing on this. So it's blade-like almost because of how sharp it becomes because it gets fractured and it's because it's silica rich. And we have to decide, you know, is this sample? Is this, you know, um, felsic? Is this mafic? Is this intermediate? And based on its color, it kind of gives us an idea of where it belongs. We can use that color to, you know, to distinguish a name. We can use that name to distinguish within our chart over here, or we can look at our uh, Bowen's reaction series to see where does it belong on here. So anyway, again, I understand. Crash course, looking at igneous rocks. Um, the main thing I wanted to bring into your you know, attention is 
the families, how we identify it. Um, you can look, you know, dive a little deeper, find more about what the different grain sizes, the names that we use that are associated. But I just want to give you a very quick overview. So thank you for your time. I hope this was helpful. And don't forget to check out the next video, which is going to be on sedimentary. It's sedimentary, my dear Watson, rocks. Uh, sounds great. And we will talk soon.